So our um, topic today is on medical aid in dying. 2011 was the first sec pause session on this topic, and it was John Warren um, talking about, are you in favor of MAID? There's been six sessions since, and there's, they've been on the ethics of MAID, the politics of it, the legal implement, implementation of it, or the, and now the actual implementation. So today's session is called, In What Way Are Medical Assistance in Dying Experiences Different in the Context of Rural Living? And our presenter is Dr. Julia Brosolotto, Brosolotto. Uh, Julie is an associate professor in the public health program at the University of Lethbridge, Faculty of Health Sciences. She recently held a seven-year Alberta Innovation Health Solutions Research Chair in Rural Health and Well-Being. She completed her doctorate at the York University in Health Policy and Equity Program and uh, is an interdisciplinary social scientist and a qualitative health services research. Julia's research program looks at aging and dying as, as, as they pertain to continuing care settings, age-friendly communities, and MAID. So please join me in welcoming Julia. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up in the back if you can hear me. Okay. Great. So thank you all for making it out today. We already acknowledge that it's not easy travel weather. And you'll hear a bit about that later in the presentation as well, the challenges of getting around in southern Alberta during uh, perilous weather. So to give you a bit of context for this study, why did we decide to look at made in rural communities? Right? Uh, well, I was originally attending a um, South Zone Ethics Committee meeting for Alberta Health Services, and this would have been, I think, around 2019. And Dr. Dion Walsh was presenting about MAID. And at the time, she was the physician lead for South Zone. And she mentioned just in passing that there were some differences they were starting to notice in terms of urban and rural distinctions. Right, so maybe a le less access to information in some rural communities, maybe some different attitudes, but this wasn't something they'd really explored in depth. And so I had a research chair looking at rural health at that time, and I reached out to her afterwards and said, this is something I'd be really curious about exploring. So our team did a review first to get started, looking at made laws and policies, and we highlighted some key rural considerations. And thank you. Thank you, that's great. Oh, I think it's still coming down. Okay, um, so we looked at, you know, are these policies and these um, laws attentive to rural considerations? And the, you know, broad conclusion is that no, not really, right? So we published those results. Uh, there's a hyperlink there. Uh, then we looked to some of the academic literature on MAID. And we found that while people were sometimes Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, sure. Okay, so we found that uh, people were sometimes speculating about what MAID might mean in rural communities, but there wasn't actually a lot of people actually going out and interviewing folks in rural communities and asking about their experiences. And we thought this was an important gap, right? We wanted to probe this because uh, rurality is a significant and often overlooked determinant of health, has lots of implications for our health and well-being where we live. Uh, so there was a concern in some of the literature that had been expressed that in rural communities, you know, we often see fewer health services available, fewer social services, greater distances to travel to things. There was a bit of a concern that people might turn to MAID as a default option then if they weren't able to access other things. So we kept that in mind and said, well, let's go and see what people have to say. 
Um, so I'll just give a brief overview of our methods. If you have more questions about this, we can talk about that later. But just briefly, we did a qualitative exploratory study where we used semi-structured interviews, which means we had some questions in mind, but we let the conversations go wherever they needed to. Um, we used purpose of sampling to recruit participants. So we specifically sought out people who had experience with the MADE program. And this included people from several different categories. So that was healthcare professionals. Uh, it was family members of someone who had pursued MAID and patients who had requested MAID but hadn't yet set a date for it. So the number breakdowns are there for you. We've got nine nurses, seven physicians, two clinical ethicists, eight family members, and three patients. And this was also done during peak COVID. <laughs> so it was a challenging time in healthcare. So, you know, we were very fortunate to get this many people who were able to meet with us. At the end of each interview, we did a demographic survey just so we could get a sense of this sample and understand the demographics we were working with. Then we analyzed this data using Braun and Clark's approach to thematic analysis. So because we were focused on virality, even though we found many other things that we've talked about in different papers we've put out from this, I'll share with you today three rural specific findings. And we'll get into details about each of these and I'll share with you some quotes from participants. So the three of them are first, in placing made, the specifics of Southern Alberta, right? Getting into the fact that context matters and the specifics of place really informed people's thinking and experiences. Two, the realities of the relational rural. And I'll explain what I mean by that, but really looking at the fact that relationships and close connections are an important part of rural living. And third, this notion of working with what you've got when there may be fewer services or resources in a rural community than there are in a bigger setting. Um, if people get creative, innovative, and still really rise to the occasion to provide quality care. So the first piece about situating made in Southern Alberta, there are three things I'll share with you about that. The first is the influence that the uh, reputation or culture of the region has on people's experiences and expectations. The second is connection to ranching and farming and how that informed people's thinking about MAID. And the third is the rural landscape itself and what that meant to people. So I'll share a bit about each of these now. So when it came to the reputation and culture, um, most participants spoke about the ways that this impacted what they expected around the MAID program. For instance, some people said, you know, the reputation has, or sorry, the uh, community has a reputation for being fairly socially conservative. And so sometimes people expected that there would be community pushback or opposition to MAID. And in some ways, some of those expectations were confirmed. So for instance, we found out that um, conscientious objection is quite high in Southern Alberta and that this high rate of conscientious objection has implication for access to made services, to uh, information about the program, and it can inform the stigma that surrounds the practice. Similarly, a few participants told us that they experienced unprofessional comments from colleagues who weren't supportive of MADE and interacted with leaders in the health authority who had actively worked against the program. And some nurses said they felt that they had to keep their involvement in the MADE program a secret. But I think it's important for us to note that um, demographic characteristics around religion or political affiliation aren't necessarily reflective of someone's views about MAID. So in our sample, and this was all people who had some experience with the program, 16 participants identified as having no religious affiliation, four identified as Christian, one as Roman Catholic, one as Anglican, one as Jewish, and six as spiritual. 14 identified as having no political party affiliation, six as liberal, six as conservative, two as New Democrats, and one preferred not to disclose political affiliation. So I just share this demographic data to remind us that, you know, uh, support for opposition to MAID isn't neatly divided along party lines and uh, reminds us to avoid making sweeping generalizations or assumptions. And so on the flip side, some participants' experiences challenged stereotypes about the region. Several participants claimed that the backlash they expected never actually came to fruition, and that more often than not, people agreed to disagree about MAID if they didn't share the same views. And some people attribute this to what we called an ethos of rural independence, sort of a guiding value of, you know, to each their own, and this idea that, you know, I may not agree with what you choose to do, but, you know, I respect your right to do something different than me. So I'll share a few quotes with you here. 
Uh, one nurse said, Southern Alberta is, well, I call it the Bible Belt of Alberta. So there's a lot of extremely religious groups down here. I think that if people are choosing to go the maid route, but they're part of a community that doesn't support that, then the patient or that family have the potential to be ostracized from their communities. So it does make it more of a challenge. Another nurse said, I was raised in a very conservative religious background. It's my personal belief that it's not my place to agree or disagree, like or dislike. Influence, tell you yes or no, or that you should or shouldn't do this. It's my place to respect your decision, your freedom of choice. So that's why I don't have an issue with my upbringing being part of the MAID program. Because this isn't about me and my beliefs. This is about allowing a person to choose their destiny, their lifestyle. Because again, I don't have to like it, I don't have to agree with it, but I dang well need to respect your personal decisions. So then I mentioned that we also heard about connection to ranching and farming and how that informed MAID. And that was an interesting one to me because in the literature, there, I had never seen any discussion of how this could potentially impact MAID. Some participants said that their rural roots and personal history with these practices um, motivated them to get involved with the program. They said it reflected similar values about alleviating suffering for living beings at the end of their lives. So one physician said this, and sorry, this is more text than I'd normally put on a slide, but I, I didn't want to cut it, because um, I think it's a really meaningful quote. Something I hear from patients all the time, and it's how I feel too, I grew up on a farm, I grew up on a ranch, and patients tell me this all the time. They say, we wouldn't treat our animals this way. Like we've been putting down animals in humane ways that we care about for I don't know how long, right? And you know, that was something I grew up on the farm seeing, and I'll never forget. I accidentally ran over a cat one time in the farm and was devastated. And my dad came out with a gun and said, this is sad and it's scary, and I know you're young, but this animal is not allowed to suffer. And so that was just something we were kind of used to. Animals, cows, things that we're not gonna recover. We were taught that that's a way to be humane and to try and not let things suffer. And a family member of a maid patient said to us, my father always said we were more humane to our animals than we are to each other. So that's why it was such a beauty that he got to do what he wanted to do which was receive a medically assisted death. And lastly for this one, the rural landscape itself was important to a number of residents. Uh, we heard that a lot of people wanted to die on their land. They wanted to die with their animals present or involved in their end of life plans or connected with the rural landscape in some way. So an ethicist told us, one farmer had made out in his field, like he had it all set up on a little hill, you know, where he could see his land and all that, that's where he wanted to pass. And a patient who had, again, uh, been approved for MAID but hadn't yet booked a date said, I don't wanna be on machines, I don't wanna be in a respite home, I don't wanna be in a nursing home. Those are all bad things from their perspective. And it's different than in rural than in urban settings. I've lived on the end of a dirt road for most of my life. When I pass away, there's gonna be no gravesite. We're gonna take my horse and he's gonna haul my fat ass and the ashes from one of my favorite dogs and we're going west of town and they're gonna spread them in the wind. So again, you can see, you know, we haven't done a, a, an urban comparison to see, um, but this language about the importance of place and the significance of land really came through in a way I haven't seen in more general made literature. And we saw that as a distinctly rural consideration. Okay, so the second piece here was around the relational rural. So looking at rural places and the close connections that exist there. So there's three things that I'll speak to you about there. Uh, this notion of dual roles, right? So in a rural community, you might be the physician in town, but also you might um, have a child who, sorry, let's, let's think of a good example here. You might be the physician in town and one of your patients might also be the coach of your child's hockey team. Right? You might know people in both a professional and personal context. And in a larger urban center, there's less chance of that dual role. Right? There's just more people, less chance of that overlap. And that's often framed in rural health scholarship as a risk. Right? It's this ethical thing you have to really carefully mitigate, for good reason, because there can be conflicts of interest. But it's usually framed as a bad thing. And what we heard in this case is that it's seen as a, an asset for made provision. And I'll tell you a bit about that. We also heard that there's limited privacy and heightened visibility in rural communities, right? This notion of living in a fishbowl where everyone kind of knows what's going on with everyone. I mean, even a city the size of Lethbridge, there's often, a, you get chatting about people, you realize you're one or two degrees of separation away from their family, et cetera. So with that 
come certain things like potential for stigma, potential for backlash, and a need to be really careful about patient confidentiality, right? Especially with something like MAID, where you want to be very transparent, clearly document everything that's going on, but also not want people outside of the group to know that it's happening, because patients might say, well, I don't want members of my community knowing that this is how dad died, right? So trying to strike that balance is a unique rural consideration. And lastly, that rural care was seen as preferable by patients and family members. And I'll speak to that in a moment. Okay, so this piece around dual roles. Um, I'll read you this quote from a physician first. So he said, I will say, if you work in rural medicine, you deal with dual role relationships. And if you don't know how to deal with that, you've got a problem. And so that's not escaped me and made. I've provided for at least a small handful of people I know. I've assessed people that I know. I'm always cautious to say that there's other assessors we'll find. And I mean, I would never show up as a provider without being involved in the situation. But it's interesting. They want it. The patients want it. And I mean, that's one of the joys of real cradle to the grave care. And it's not easy, I think, for some physicians, but it's never easy when our patients go, you know? And so I think it is one of the things that can be worked around. And I know I've seen family physicians who aren't part of the MADE program per se, but will step up for their patients. And I think that is one of maybe real strengths the rural experience. So we found that these personal connections between care providers and uh, their patients wasn't just an inevitable part of rural care, but seen as a real asset to be leveraged. Right, that the people doing the assessing said, I feel really confident, I feel like conviction in my decision to approve this person because I know their story. Right, it wasn't just in a chart, I've known them in the community, I know their family, and I feel like it's a much richer story that I'm working with. And so, you know, they, they feel like they have more information to draw from. And a lot of people, again, reference this long-standing history as a real value. They said it's not a stranger at the end of life. Right, that that's really significant, that they know the person who's there to make that final decision. And one nurse said, you know, whether it's a made death or not in our facility, the person who's died is usually someone we've looked after. The one man, he was one of my first patients as a grad nurse. I'd look after him off and on for the better part of a decade. I liked it. I like having that rapport with patients before, and I like having that history with them, so hopefully they're comfortable with me. It's not just a stranger showing up in their last day on this planet. The last one I did was my doctor's father. My physician's son taught my son swimming lessons, and I did a particular activity with their daughter. It was very emotional, but I was really glad I could be there for them because I have relationships with four people in the family. It was nice that they knew me. I wasn't a stranger. Right. Okay, so this piece about limited privacy and heightened visibility, again, smaller communities, people tend to know what's going on in each other's lives in a different way than in a large city. And we heard that a lot of people felt that they had to keep their involvement with the MAID program quite quiet. There was a fear that if you were a provider, this might mean that patients wouldn't trust you in your general practice if they knew you also participated in MAID. Um, there was fear that it could sever professional relationships if you worked with colleagues who didn't support the practice. Family members expressed some concerns saying, I don't feel like I can go to a grief support group because people you know, didn't know that that's how my dad died or they wouldn't understand this form of grief, right, in the same way. And so one nurse said, I mean, I'm open about it, but definitely it's not something I advertise. You kind of want to be a little bit careful. And it's not because I'm embarrassed. I just don't want people to think of me differently or treat me differently or judge me or question the care that I give my patients because I do MAID, right? Like just because I do MAID doesn't mean I don't want someone to have palliative care or I don't want them to have active chemo care, right? It's what the patient wants. So there was this fear. There was also fear, you know, some physicians got involved with the program and were told to prepare for the possibility their kids might not get invited to birthday parties. And so there were very real considerations about that. And I mentioned that family members also sometimes felt like they had to sort of keep this as a secret if the, you know, the patient didn't want others to know about it. And they also felt a responsibility to protect the healthcare providers' identities as well. So one family member said, I think there's only three doctors in town who are involved, and I know it's a risk to their practice. They're willing to take that risk, which I admire. It's divisive in some ways. And we were careful who we let know, and they don't know who the provider was that assisted us. We try to keep it that way for their benefit. And so I mentioned also as well, you know, this tension between uh, transparency and confidentiality, 
right? Say you're working in a long-term care home and a patient says, I'd like to pursue MAID, but I don't want any of the staff here to know and I don't want you know, visitors who are coming in and out to know, so could you do it discreetly? Right, so then there becomes this whole process of wanting to document everything. You still have law and ethics to follow, but also then wanting to try and keep things as quiet as possible to respect the patient's wishes. And again, so often, you know, there's what's referred to as the deficit model in rural health scholarship. So often it gets framed as like urban but with less. Right? And many people who receive care in rural communities know that's not usually true. I mean, there might be fewer tech services available or longer distances to things, um, but high quality care is still very much possible. And we heard from one family member, um, she said, the doctor was amazing. I mean, she made house calls for a week. Every night she came to the house to see my mom, to sit with me. You're not gonna get that in the city, so I'll take rural. Right, so in this instance, again, it's uh, having those relationships, that proximity, and having someone who is willing to come and meet each day um, and really be a part of the process, not just you know, show up on the day of. And one of the patients said, we're very fortunate in our town because we've got a really good medical team here. So there's a doctor shortage, but it's nothing like the doctor shortage in a nearby city. I have a family physician, and if I didn't have a family physician, there's a 90% chance I wouldn't be here today. And I have a ton of respect for him. He saved my life. So for every day that I've had in the last year and a bit, that's been because of him, because of our healthcare system. So for me, it's kind of special that he'll be the made provider. He knows the community. He knows who I am. He knows my wife. You know, it's kind of like you've been to a funeral where the funeral director does the talk and you know, he's never met the person. He starts saying things and misspells names or mispronounces names and all that kind of stuff. It's a very different experience. And that really resonated for me. I remember my grandmother's funeral, the person giving the talk, ha didn't know her well and was saying things that didn't feel exactly right. So that really landed for me about how it's meaningful when there is that knowing. And lastly, this piece of working with what you've got. Of course, there are always going to be shortcomings. We're always looking for ways to improve service provision and care. But we also wanted to give credit that the people who we interviewed had great things to say about the care that was provided. Um, there are, of course, challenges, and the ones that were at the fore were limited healthcare workers, less access to specialized services, and travel challenges. So within this rural context, we're dealing with the uh, inevitability of some of these challenges that we see often. With limited healthcare workers, there's already fewer in rural and even fewer still who participate in MAID. So some physicians, like the one quoted here, uh, got involved to s try and fill that gap. Right? said specifically, I got involved because there was no one else doing it in town. Another physician said, you know, I take referral from my colleagues, but they spoke to the fact that there's not a lot of training and education available for this in rural settings. He said that um, they use the true rural teaching ideology of see one, do one, teach one, and explains that in this here, but said, you know, I'll do the first made provision with a new provider, but the expectation is then they'll go on and do it on their own the next time and then train someone else. All right, so for such a big and significant procedure, that's not a ton of preparation, right? So something to be mindful of, that this is something you're working with, that's what you've got. There's a lot of um, emotional support, but not as much institutionalized and, and formalized training. There's also less access to specialized services. This is something, you know, we might be familiar with. Um, an ethicist had told us, you know, the Canada Health Act says that you can get equal access to health care no matter where you are in the country, and he said, that's laughable. Right? We just know that's not true. If you're in Calgary, across from the Foothills Hospital, it's not going to be the same as if you're in a rural community. And so he pointed out, that's true for palliative care too. Right? You're not going to have the same access in a small town that you will in a big center. And a physician also said to us, you know, disability supports, resources for chronic pain. Southern Alberta is really limited compared to, say, in Calgary. Right? So we see this urban-rural divide. And of course, this feels resonant this week, uh, travel challenges, right? That's something that can be difficult um, just because of the amount of time it takes to drive between communities. Sometimes a physician has to go to a different community because there's no physician there providing it. So they're ping-ponging around. And if perhaps the uh, pharmacist in a community is a conscientious objector, you might have to drive from one community to a pharmacy in another community to get the medications 
to an altogether different community for the provision, return the empty medications, then drive home, and something that could have been an hour procedure, let's say, ends up being a whole day. Right, so that's just a consideration that has implications for scheduling for healthcare providers, um, because these things can happen on short notice. Someone can be approved for MAID and then you know, wait months or even years potentially before they decide it's time and they're ready. Right, so healthcare providers then have to be pretty nimble with their schedules. So in conclusion, our findings confirmed, refined, and challenged some of the ideas from the existing literature. There are some difficulties in rural, um, but there are also some real assets. We found that place matters and that rurality is significant for social and geographic reasons. And as a result, we suggested that policies and service provision should be more context sensitive. Right? We understand there need to be some uh, federal and provincial policies, but that within that, providers might need spe uh, special supports depending on their context. Right? Things that address anonymity, things that address the, the grief that comes with providing for someone you know personally. And lastly, an important note is that we were collecting our data right around the time of uh, the passing of Bill C-7, and that removed the reasonably foreseeable death criterion. So you no longer needed a terminal illness. And so all of the participants in our study were working with people who already had a terminal diagnosis. And so this opens up some potential ethical issues around people in rural communities who might have a chronic illness and be pursuing MAID. And that's where the issue around having access to other social and healthcare resources becomes really important because we don't want it to become that thing where people can't access other services and turn to MAID you know, as a default. Right? You want people who are going to pursue it to do that because it's genuinely what they want. Um, and one last thing just that we mentioned, the shortage of care workers, I want to mention that all of our participants said, we don't think the answer to that shortage is to force people who are opposed to it to provide. Some of them explicitly said that would be unethical, we want to support people's moral convictions, and that the care that was uh, talked about in the study was so good because it was people who were passionate, who really cared about this practice and believed in it, and put in the effort to make people's last days really meaningful. So, um, yeah, I think that's just important to note, is the people involved with this had said, you know, it, the people who did it did it well because they cared about it, and those who don't want to be involved shouldn't have to be. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'll open the floor for discussion. Thank you very much, Julia. I, that was a very interesting and informative presentation. And I'm sure that a lot of those in the audience have formulated some good questions to, uh, to ask over the next half hour. Uh, please keep your questions brief, or at least the preamble brief, and uh, be succinct and clear in your questions. And those who want to ask questions, just come up this side uh, and form a line. The Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization is providing this room free of charge. So uh, we encourage you to patronize their food services. And thanks to University of Lethbridge and Rogers TV for their continuing support. And also to the Lethbridge Herald and other media for covering our sessions. Okay, so I invite you to line up. And, uh, and if you have written questions, please also bring those forward to me. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ian Hurdle. I come from a position of a retired physician who often felt prior to MAID, we failed a lot of our patients because we couldn't control their pain or their circumstances. It really cut to the heart of when you really care about your patient. One of my daughters is a family physician, and Dion Walsh was actually her preceptor, and she's quite involved in MAID, so I hear about it also. So from my perspective, one of the things where in some units and places they, 
passed, they wouldn't provide MAID, and people were actually transferred to a rural setting to get their MAID. The second thing is, when it first came out, a lot of palliative care units said, no, no, we don't want anything to do with it. And currently, about 22% of MAID uh, procedures are carried out actually in palliative care units. I wonder if you could comment on those. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, one piece around that is there's been a lot of discussion and debate about whether MAID and palliative care are two different, completely distinct end-of-life options or if they're kind of on the same continuum, right? And you've seen there are some folks who work as palliative care nurses or physicians and are also involved with MAID. Um, so it's not always a neat division, but the tensions certainly do exist between the two areas broadly. Um, I think mostly where I've seen that is around some people saying, well, if we could control pain well enough or if we could create the right conditions, um, then perhaps people wouldn't be pursuing MAID. Um, we did hear from some people who said, that's also a choice patients can make though, and sometimes folks will say, I, I want you know, MAID under these conditions to plan that last day, to have certain rituals, have certain people there, um, and, and choose the terms. And they said, I recognize all the benefits of palliative care, but that's not the ending I want. And so, you know, we said it can only be a meaningful choice if it's really available, right? So well, the first piece is making sure people can access it, and then whether they, they do or not is up to them. But um, the tension that you raise, I think, is, is definitely one that we're going to continue to deal with. And I don't have a, a solid answer for how we navigate that, but yeah, thank you for sharing it. So my name is Mark Gettle. I'm just uh, wondering, was there, were there any comments regarding using MAID for mental health problems? Is that already part of MAID, or is it still just a movement to bring it in? And also, did, did people comment on that? That's a more controversial area. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. So um, there's a specific acronym now. It's, so it's MAID for where people have mental health as a sole underlying condition. It's a long acronym. Um, and so that was meant to be reevaluated in the law last year. The government did an expert panel. They were divided on this. And so psychiatrists and mental health professionals weren't you know, feeling that they could get on the same page about what was best. So the government kicked it down the road, the federal government did, uh, a year. And so in 2024 is when they're making a decision on that. And it's expected they will expand the law to include mental illness. And particularly the physicians we spoke with, a number of them said, I might not do provisions for that, right? I might do track one cases where there's a reasonably foreseeable death and I feel okay about hastening that death, but I feel some moral distress around the idea of providing it for someone where it's solely um, a mental illness, right? That's the couple of people who we spoke with said, um, support for it can be on a continuum. It's not you're always against MAID or you're always in favor. Some people said, you know, I was against it, saw this one instance that seemed beautiful and I get it and appreciate it there, but I don't want to provide. Um, and we heard some people saying, I might stop being involved if that is the way it goes, or I might turn down those kinds of cases because just personally it doesn't sit well with me. So it, I think that is going to be the next big area of discussion and debate. Hello, my name is Mary Shillington. Thank you for that very great information. Um, chronic illness, uh, I'm, I would like you to explain a little bit more about the circumstances that, uh, in which that might be uh, uh, an option for the person and what they have to go through as they're struggling with you know, their final days. Yeah, I mean, the argument behind expanding the conditions for MAID from a terminal illness, the argument goes, well, if somebody has a terminal illness, they're likely to die relatively soon anyway, right? They've been given a diagnosis that means we see their death is relatively imminent. Um, and so people have argued, well, my death isn't relatively imminent, but I have, to use the legal language of, of MAID, uh, grievous and irremediable suffering without a reasonably foreseeable end to it. And so I'm a candidate for this more so than someone who's going to have a natural death soon, right? Because my suffering, who knows how long that will last. That was the argument that was put forward to create that. And so it did pass. Um, and so there have been a number of debates about that. 
um, not to go too philosophically in the weeds, but I mean, to what extent are we trying to get rid of human suffering when that's a part of life? But it's that part of grievous and irremediable suffering, right? This, this really extent of this person says, I can no longer bear this, um, which gets further complicated when you add mental illness into the mix. But with chronic illness, it really was set up so that you would have to be assessed by um, you'd have to look through, it's been a while since I checked the updated criteria, but you have to be assessed by two people who are experts in your condition, as well as uh, your physician who assesses you. So there are a number of measures that assess the nature of the condition. Um, I, can't, I can't, I'm not sure if that answers your question, does it? Yeah. Um, so again, it's not just sort of this person saying, you know, I, I'm uncomfortable with my symptoms, I'd like to apply. There is a, a rigorous process with some safeguards in place. But of course, some people argue they should be stronger, and others say they're sufficient. So the debate continues. Thank you. Uh, Leona Jacobs. I read your article. I mean, if you can enjoy an academic article, <laughs> I enjoyed your article. Um, my question, I actually have two prompted, one prompted by Mary, which is to perhaps um, update us on the whole issue of advanced planning um, and medical assistance. The other is, the real curiosity I have is, and whether it's in your scope or outside your scope of your, of your work, is the issue of the rhetoric around medical assistance in dying, and how does that influence people's perceptions of it? Because we have a lot of political rhetoric echoing right now, and so how is that influencing people? Thank you. Okay, lots of good stuff in there. Um, the first piece around advanced planning. So there is discussion about can someone say, under X condition, I want to receive MAID? Um, that gets really tricky because there is a requirement that the person have capacity at the time of the provision, right? Because otherwise then we are ending the life of a person who can't consent to the procedure at the time it's happening. And so a lot of people have said, well, I'm okay with that. I'm telling you in advance, I've wanted this for months, you know, and even if I lose consciousness at the time, you have my consent. There are some physicians who say, I don't feel comfortable. If that person can't tell me in that moment that that's what they want, they should always be able to back out, right? So there's been a lot of debate about it. Um, currently, there is no advanced planning in terms of dementia, right? So sometimes people say, well, can I say if I have dementia and it advances, could I request it in advance? You can't under the law currently. Um, there are some parts that have shifted, I think, around if you just lose consciousness at the time. So let's say someone's condition is that they're in and out. They consent on Monday. Provision is Wednesday. If they lose consciousness, I think now that can be permitted. Um, but not like lots of time in advance for someone to say, if I get ALS, then I want, you know, made. It would really be more immediate. The second piece, um, you had said, rhetoric. please. Thank you, the rhetoric. So we, uh, for, along with this project, we also did a scan of Canadian news media. And so we found that some of the concepts that were talked about most often were vulnerability, autonomy, um, and it's been two years, I don't remember what the other one, those are the two that came up the most. And I think a lot of the rhetoric has been around autonomy and liberty and saying, you know, this is a free choice people make. This is something where under conditions you don't have a lot of control, you get to exercise some. That has been the language we saw used by a lot of people who are proponents. And a lot of people who are either cautious supporters or opposed say, you know, we really have to be mindful of vulnerability, right? Patients who are suffering, um, their choices are made in relational context. So if they're afraid of being a burden to their family, you know, is that a fully autonomous choice, right? And these things happen in contexts where um, people are afraid that they're going to be costly to the healthcare system or a burden to their family, or they can't access other supports and services. So those would be the two sort of alongside each other, sometimes competing, sometimes working together, concepts that I've heard in the rhetoric and seem to be reflected in political conversations too. Sort of the freedom to pursue the death you want, and also the fact that we should protect people from pursuing that if there's other ways we could support them and care for them first. Does that answer that question? At least begin to. What are they labeled? Sorry, what are? What, what? Yeah. Sorry. There's also the issue of, of how 
medical assistance is referred to in terms of, you know, this, this form of end of life care, how is it referred to and, and does that have an impact? Yes, thank you. MADE itself, like medical assistance in dying, is strategic language, right? Um, frames it as a clinical procedure, whereas in other jurisdictions there's different language around voluntary euthanasia or um, aid in dying in different places. And depending on cultural context, you know, different countries choose different language. Um, in Germany, they really avoided the use of language around euthanasia because um, it had very loaded context there. And so again, like language matters, this was really meant to sort of treat it as an end of life medical option, and it is strategic framing. It doesn't mean that's nefarious strategy, but it is strategic, right? So, thank you. Uh, my name's Jan Langford. Great presentation, very interesting. Um, uh, two things, on advanced direct uh, and advanced requests, if people are interested in supporting that, yes, it's complicated, but there is discussion about it. Uh, Dying with Dignity has a petition um, that is going to the federal government. It's open right now, so you can get access and sign that e-petition uh, if you go on the Dying with Dignity website. Um, and then second, I'm just wondering about access to made for rural people and whether you looked at settings. So for the people in your study, were those provisions of made at home or were any facility based? And if, did you look at the differences there? Great, thank you. Um, most of the ones that we dealt with were facility-based, so either in a hospital, um, long-term care, or palliative. Um, I think there had been a few at-home provisions, more like the ones the ethicists were speaking to. And, I mean, we didn't hear about any where the patient self-administered, because that is an option as well, rather than the physician or nurse practitioner administering the drugs. Um, so it was always administered by a physician or nurse practitioner in these cases, and again, mostly in facilities. Um, it's interesting, too, there's some literature on the idea of a good rural death, and this idea that, um, according to rural residents, this is some scholarship from, I believe it's Donna Wilson in Edmonton, um, that rural residents say dying in ho home or in their home community was a really important criterion for a good death. And so I think that's been a consideration in the mix too of, you know, the hospital might be a feeling of part of your home. If it's a small community and you go volunteer there and you have friends who work there, that might be more an extension of home than in a big urban center where it's not uh, as you know, intertwined in the community. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Hi, my name is Bob Campbell. Thank you for your presentation, very well done. My question, is more about, you. we talked about care. Did the question or the option of hospice care ever come up? Because it seemed here in Southern Alberta where hospice is not an option that's made available for people. And that sometimes changes their perception about, about uh, their, their final journey, so to speak. And from a, not, uh, just, and, and, uh, just a comment about the mental health side. I worked in mental health for many years. We have to be very careful in that particular one because it's, anyway, I just make that comment as a cautionary note. But I'd like to hear your comments about hospice care if that ever came up in any of your conversations. It's a great question and unfortunately a very short answer which is that it didn't. We didn't really hear much talk about hospice care. Um, most of the people, like the patients we spoke with, were still living in their homes. Um, and of course, they were the people who were well enough to participate in an interview on this, right? If someone is experiencing grievous and irremediable suffering to the point that they've applied for MAID, they may not be well enough to participate in a research study. So, you know, acknowledging that is part of the mix as well, I'm sure. Um, family members had talked more about people who were either staying in hospital for an extended time or were in long-term care. So I didn't really hear much about hospice in this project, but... It's another setting that's absolutely a part of the conversation. Good afternoon, Bev Moodle-Atherstone. Thank you so very much. What interesting research. That's fascinating. Um, with the reduced access 
to medical doctors, ERs, and hospitals, and <clears throat> reduced access to social services under this government. How do we, as a society, ensure that MAID is not seen as a default to lack of health care, support, and social services? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I mean, I think that is an important piece that Bill C-7 has really, I mean, there were people who were saying it's a slippery slope and that could end up being the case even under Bill C-14, but especially around Bill C-7 when you no longer need a terminal illness, there's been a renewed conversation, I'd say, around that. Um, and a very reasonable argument that if the government is putting in the, um, how do I phrase this? If you're going to provide people with the opportunity to end their lives, you should also resource them to live their lives well. And that if people uh, don't have the financial or healthcare or social care resources um, and then are choosing MAID, that that's a failure of the state, right? To, prov to provide the conditions for people to live with dignity as well as to die with dignity. So goes the argument, right? And so I've also heard the response that the two can live alongside one another, that MAID has the role that it plays in the healthcare system, and that alongside that we need some more robust supports and social programs and social services so that people you know, living on um, low income support or on disability support don't feel compelled to use MAID because they have no other option, right? Um, and that there is a responsibility to promote people to live well and to the end of their life on their terms that made is fully freely chosen and not systemically coerced because people don't feel there's any other avenue to pursue. So I don't know if that answers how we do it. I think political pressure is an important piece, but yeah, I've seen those two arguments alongside each other. Hello, my name is Knut Peterson. <coughs> uh, I've been uh, thinking about, it's pretty important to tell your kids and grandkids maybe uh, about your plans. Was that a topic that you discovered when you did, the, did your research, the importance of communicating with your loved ones as to your wishes to die the way you want to die. Because, thank you so much for that question. Because of the work I do, I have these conversations with people all the time, right? Um, and so it's so often that I'm told, yeah, families will go through things where one spouse dies and they were, you know, 89, and the other spouse says, well, we never got to talking about it because it seemed morbid. Right? And so people don't know what their plans are, their wishes are, so there was absolute, it wasn't a real focus of the interviews, but people said it was important to the conversations they were having around it. There were a couple family members who initially said, I wasn't initially supportive or comfortable with them receiving MAID. And the more time I spent with them seeing what their day-to-day -day life was like at this point in their lives, the more I, you know, talked to them to understand the request. You know, maybe at the end we agreed to disagree, but by the end I, I supported them. Right? Maybe they, they weren't 100% comfortable or didn't want the person to leave earlier than they had to, but said at the end they, they respected the decision. Um, so I don't know if that speaks to it, but it did seem like those conversations were incredibly meaningful to families at the end for kind of bringing them together and creating these moments. Again, we heard a lot about ritual on final days and the ways that people chose their final playlists and their final snacks and the way they wanted to spend time with people on that day. So those discussions were important. On that note, Julie, uh, did you come across any situations where the kids encouraged their parents to, to, to leave the world? Thankfully, I did not. <laughs> now, of course, I don't know all the conversations that happen behind closed doors, but no one reported of that, so thankfully. Thanks again, uh, Mary Shellington. Um, I have worked for years with special needs people, uh, usually adults, although I had, did work with children as well. And there has been times when uh, people have made comments 
like why are these people still here? Why are we uh, doing special things for them when they have nothing to offer community? And I'm presently involved with Left Large Leftbridge, and so of course I see the the gifts and so on that people can that our core members can give. So if you can answer that question, what's been your experience with feelings about disa uh, mentally and physically disabled uh, people? Thanks. So I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the disability rights community has been a really active party in um, advocating for better safeguards around MAID, uh, opposing MAID in different cases, um, but is not a homogenous group. And you know the people who are responsible for the passage of MAID, um, the two of them who were Quebec uh, folks, I'm trying to think of her name's off the top of my head and it's not coming to me right now. But they were the two people who had applied to uh, sue the government saying, we shouldn't have to apply for an exception, our disabilities, um, just someone who is physically able could end their lives on their own and I can't, I require medical assistance so on charter grounds I should have access to the service. So there are folks within um, the disability rights community saying it's an equity issue to get access, and then folks saying um, the lives of people with disabilities will be devalued under MAID, and so we should work against that, right, to say um, there should be longer periods of time after a newly acquired disability before you can apply for MAID, because you don't know what your life will look like then, right? If someone might get a diagnosis, imagine the worst, and then two months later say, you know what, this isn't what I thought it would be. Um, so it is part of the conversation as well. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer to the question, but um, that's sort of been the context in which I've heard it talked about. Yeah. Hi, my name is David Major. And um, one of the things you said kind of raised a little bit of confusion for me. My wife had made, and prior to the procedure, uh, she was able to get a friend, sign a power of attorney, so that if at the time she wasn't able to say yes, this friend could do that. And the conditions of that were that the friend uh, could not have been a family member or someone mentioned in the will. So. Is what my understanding, is it, was that correct? Or did you say that if the person can't s say yes, there's, then there's nothing gonna happen? Thank you, so depending on the timeline, the law did change on that with Bill C-7. So it's possible that it was illegal at the time of our study and was legal at the time of that procedure. That that tracks then, if that's two years ago, that might have been the case. And the language then would have been, you're exactly right around that the person who would be the power of attorney or the agent um, could not be a beneficiary, right? That they couldn't have any vested interest in or benefit monetarily or otherwise from the person's death. Um, so thank you for sharing and clarifying that. A waiver of final consent? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I think I can have the last question, and it's um, that your study was a qualitative study, Julia, um, and those are very valuable, mm -hmm. but, but I'm curious to know if there's any quantitative studies around the differences between made provision in urban versus rural settings. You know, I'm not aware of any yet. Um, there's some scholarship, Barbara Pasut and Sally Thorne in BC have done some rural made scholarship, but I haven't seen much quantitative work. It's tended to be more uh, wanting to understand the nature of people's experiences rather than the breadth of the issue, which I think we tend to turn to quantitative more to kind of understand the scope of a, a large problem. And I think because you know, even when we were sampling in Alberta, at that time it had only been legal for a few years, and saying, it's not like we could interview 500 people on this, if we, even if we had the time and resources to do so, because there's just not that many who've participated in rural southern Alberta. Uh, so the numbers are smaller, so we're not looking to generalize and say this is what everyone's experience will be. Instead, we're saying, you know, this is a snapshot in time, particular people's stories, and, you know, there are some conclusions that they drew and that we draw, but that we sort of, you know, use them to inform conversation rather than to be predictive or, yeah, the way that a quantitative study might um, draw some different conclusions. 
Yeah. You're welcome. All right, Bev, you get one last question. I was raising my hand. <laughs> uh, just as a follow-up, um, I've been thinking about your your statement of the failure of state, the failure of the state to live with dignity. Um, could a person then sue the federal government for lack of following the charter? Um, in other words, sue the maybe sue the provincial government for lack of following the charter. Um, or would we need a federal bill, do you think, to ensure that people have the right kind of medical and social supports so that they do not see MAID as a default? So I will say that I'm not a legal scholar, and so that is a bit outside of my scope to know exactly how to go about that. I mean, that is one of the interesting things with human rights is, you know, we have a right to water, a right to housing, and yet those aren't always provided, right? And so what kind of redress are people entitled to when those needs aren't met by the state? Um, and so there's a variety of mechanisms where people can express you know, discontent, discontent with that and advocate um, in informal and informal ways. Um, but in terms of a legal path forward, that, that's a bit outside of my scope. Thanks. Well, thank you everyone for your inspiring questions. And so, Julie, I'm gonna give you the last opportunity to give us a key take home message. Um, oh, just when you're saying. <laughs> Well, I, I give you a few, so I won't repeat some of the benefits of rural and some of those things. One thing that I thought was interesting is that a few people had said, you think you know what you'd want until you're in this situation, and then you find out. And that was expressed by all different people in different situations. People saying, I thought I would oppose it, and then I saw this, and I shifted my thinking. People who said, I thought I'd want it, and then the situation came, and it was just a comfort in my back pocket knowing I had the approval and I never wanted to book a date. And, you know, just kind of that reminder to me that, like, you know, I have my views on, on particular things and that the lived experience is really important because in those conditions, um, there's new data, new feelings, new other ways of um, engaging with the situation that inform your thinking and that we don't know exactly what we would do until we're there, but it's valuable to start thinking and talking about it leading up to that. So thank you all. Mm -hmm.